<laughs> Beloved by all. A subject that every minister or congregation looks forward to all year. Actually, in all my years here, I have never done a stewardship message before. The UUA calls it plan giving to make it sound nicer, but this is a tough subject. So, here we go. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Here we are at the UUA Westfield to the telephone waiting for calls of support. I have first phone call. <laughs> Hello? Yes? You can give 1%? Oh, that's fantastic. Oh, thank you so much. And we have wonderful gifts for those who can give 1% today. For 1%. On our <laughs> profit board. For what we need, we're heading for $600,000 so we can do lots of things in this community. And if you give 1%, you get these fine yellow pencils filled with graphite. And it has our name on them. For the press of pop. Another phone call. Hello? Wow, yes, you would also like to give 1%? Oh, that's incredible, thank you. Oh, you're gonna make it 2%. Well, thank you so, so very, very much. This is amazing, thank you. And we haven't even played any Doubt Maddie. But <laughs> yet, oh my goodness. And if you give 2%, you get one of these bookmarks. <laughs> it tells all about the LGBT things that are here at our church. And you know what? These are actually made by gay person. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Is that awesome? This is being recorded, isn't it? Wow, the phones are still ringing. They both ring. Oh my gosh. Hello, 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 hello. Wow, you're going to get 5%? That's amazing. We're really on a roll here, folks. This is great. Far more than I could imagine. Thank you. And for 5%, you get this percentile mug. <laughs> with our name on it. And you can e use it for coffee or tea. Amazing. Or you can take those fine pencils, put them right in that cup on your desk. So thank you for all the people who are donating today. So we're just moving right along here. Look at this. We're filling up our board. We're going to be raising lots of money. Before we know it, we'll be up there all the way with our fine gifts we have to give out to everybody. Amazing. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is what fundraising was like when I was a kid. You all remember Jerry Lewis and his telethons. There were pledge cards and lots of guilt and spiffy <laughs> brochures for building a new wing onto the church. It was awful. Well, we're staying away from pledge cards and guilt today to focus on the things that really matter. Mostly we're going to talk about a cello player. Let me tell you a story about the UU kind of stewardship. I got this story from Victoria Stafford. A few years ago when there was a war in Sarajevo, at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, a shell hit directly into a bread line, and 22 people were instantly killed. Vedran Smolovich lived nearby. Before the war, he had been the principal cellist at the Serio Ego Opera. He saw the carnage of the bomb outside his window himself, and he was pushed behind, beyond his capacity to endure anymore. He did the thing he could do best. He played his cello. Every day for 22 days at 4 o'clock, Smolovich put on his concert tuxedo, took up his cello, walked into the battle raging around him, and played his tribute to the 22 that had died. Snipers fired around him, mortar shells fell all around him, but he played that music to the empty streets, the smashed trucks, the burning buildings, and the terrified people still hiding. At some point, he moved to Belfast, Ireland. He moved to another war zone to play to another people, in Irish streets and Irish craters, to give other war-torn people the sound of hope. He has played in wars as well as concert halls all over the world. He is an ordinary person, long hair, cowboy boots, joking, 
friendly, a regular kind of guy. Not at all worldly, except for this way that he chooses to use up his life. But what does it matter, really? Music is heard in an instant and then it's gone. Smolovich once said, I worry, I am afraid. Are you? It is not enough just to pray to whatever God for a better future. It is necessary that we take urgent, healthy action to return to ourselves to the beauty of life without fear. That is stewardship. Urgent, healthy action to return to the beauty of life without fear. You don't know if your action is the right one or whether it will even matter or how things will turn out. How many people were touched by a crazy cellist in a war zone? How many people deep sorrows were expressed? How many felt happy for the first time in a long time, sitting in their basements and listening to the bombs? The UUs have been cellists in the war zone for a long time. Ours is a movement that from its beginning has survived and thrived on the edge of risk. For over 300 years in this country, and much longer in Europe, Unitarian Universalism has been part of a liberal religious tradition that to some extent defines itself in terms of risk, living on the edge, the frontier, the fringe. From its earliest incarnation at the far left wing of the Radical Reform Reformation, when to descend from the Roman Church, the Lutheran Church, or the Church of Calvin was to risk your life, to risk imprisonment or exile or burning at the stake. And our movement had its martyrs as well, whose hymns we still sing and the writings we still read for clues about our own humanity. From these early generations of religious freedom fighters to these later times, when seekers come to our congregations, often leaving the traditions of their childhood and all the pain and struggle that implies, ours is an enterprise involving risk. Being here, I like to think, involves healthy, urgent action to restore ourselves to the beauty of a life without fear. Ours is a saving church, and by that I mean that our lives are saved within it. People say that. They use the old vocabulary and say, I never knew there was a place like this where I could be accepted. They say, I never knew there could be a congregation that believed as I do. They say, I walked out of the church as soon as I was old enough, but until I came here, I had no idea how deeply I was longing for a connection to other people and to the sacred. They say, I was a spiritual shipwreck, and I'm still drifting, but at least... At last, I have a home. For me, it was astonishing to discover this tradition. I was a transgender man in a tradition that didn't accept me, but I found the door open to me here. Here was a religious religion welcoming science and reason while honoring mystery and wonder. Here was a religion concerned more with deeds than creeds. I felt not as if my soul were saved, but as if myself was somehow integrated and my integrity was restored as mind and heart and soul were reunited. Ours is a saving church, and it is a church that acts. I'm still talking about risk here, and healthy, urgent action that transforms fear into beauty. This is a saving church and a church that acts. It's also a church that asks and wonders, unafraid of questions that may go unanswered, unafraid of answers that may challenge its assumptions. This is a church that asks how it might be possibly we can continue to be relevant. So when the kids that come here like Audrey reach a, their age of 18, they may wish to be a part of a church like this. This is a church that asks how to serve the children now, while they're still little, right into their old age. How will we encourage their unspeakable questions? And how will we nurture their sense of justice, love of freedom, faith, their spirit, and most of all, their hope? What songs will we teach them to sing? What prayers can we offer from our hearts as examples? This is a saving church, a church that acts and a church that asks. These are some of the reasons why some of us are part of this church and contribute to its thriving ways in whatever ways we can. Some who can give, give time or money, some teach their, their children old and simple songs of old and not so simple struggles so that when new struggles come to these children, we will have something to fall back on a tradition of freedom and justice. Some support the congregation they believe in, the congregation that believes in them, simply with their presence, which is all I can give, and which is enough, and which in and of itself makes the place a holy place. And somewhere this morning, there is a child, perhaps in Syria, perhaps in Iraq, maybe in a far off place, where she was brought as a refugee. She's now 10 or 11, and in her mind, she's remembered a, a phrase of sad and wondrous cello. 
which she heard when she was very small and very scared. And she is wondering how she's going to learn to play the cello, how she will take lessons and who she will play for. Somewhere a child has a vision of peace in his war-torn country and an idea on how he can make it happen. Somewhere is a teen who has been stopped and frisked 13 times, who wants to go to law school and make a difference in the community. So how does this relate to First Universalist Church of Westfield Center? Where does a celloist in a war zone have to do with our giving? We have a lot of celloists here. Someone makes the coffee, opens the church, flowers and yard work magically appear, looking beautifully. There's always food and snacks after the service, and now we have the house music, LGBTQ events, and meetings with people attending. But we need, with this area of Obocellus to move to Ireland, to other shores that need us. For example, this would be a great time to connect with people in this area who also want peace and justice and are looking for a place to work for that. It would be a great time to pay our dues, which are very, very late, to the Unitarian Universalist Association so work could be done in places we cannot go. But right now, we're just making it. And we don't have anything extra to find out others to work with or support young cellists and leaders for peace. I don't like having to ask for more money. It's uncomfortable for all of us. But last year we had a shortage of over $7,000. We had capital expenses to pay. But with an old building, we have to expect these things are going to happen. This year we have an estimated budget of around $15,000. Plus our UU membership on top of that, which is about $1,800. So, we'll go over the more specific numbers in the meeting later with Chris, and I have a chart for that as well, because my artwork is so astounding. <laughs> Paying our UU dues would cost about $90 per member for both the national and district groups. And an estimate, if people gave about $25 more per month, we could make it. And that's asking a lot. And I know it's not even possible for some people. We can't do all that, and no one expects anybody to be able to go that far to be able to do that much. The UUA will not fall apart if we are unable to, make, to do exactly their, this number or that number for them this year. But this is in a big way we can contribute to things we know represent our values. The UUA has given me a handout for figuring out what kind of amount you might want to give overall. Maybe 1% of your income, 2 or 5. It has percentages across the top, adjusted income along the sides. You can figure it out for yourselves. You smart people, I don't need to read it to you on how the table works. It's something to think about and plan for, and as an added bonus, we even have UUA magazines that they'll give out when we give our dues. So let me hand these out. You can take it home and look, them, look it over, discuss it, decide what's best for you guys. They're nice and in color. It explains the fair share contribution guide. And it tells if you want to be a supporter, a sustainer, a visionary, or a transformer. And then on the second page, it has the suggested fair share contribution guide, depending on how much, what your adjusted monthly income is, what category you want to be in, and then what percentage of your income you want to give. This is personal and totally up to you. I won't sit one way or another for anybody. But we need to start thinking bigger than just a dozen or so of us on a Sunday morning. We need to have goals for peace and justice that are bigger. There are lonely fighters for peace and justice in our area who could feel welcomed and supported here. We need to find them somehow. We, we put our hand in and they had a pretty big success with Infinite Rainbow. In fact, last time we had 10 people attend and it is growing. We're making a difference in some people's lives. I have a young trans man who's been writing to me, trying to get the strength to come to one of the meetings. Our meeting is helping him come out. In fact, last week he started to come and he got scared and didn't. But we talked, and we'll talk again many times before the next meeting, so hopefully he'll get brave enough to actually come. And just Friday, a woman with a vision for saving the lives of LGBTQ teens in the area came to me for advice. And we have the ability to help yet another group get off the ground. She has four children. None of them are gay. Three of them are now in college. And she lives in this area. But she knows 
that there are a lot of teens in this area that we're not reaching. She's talking to her, her girlfriends and neighbors, and a lot of them said, there's nothing in this area. There's nothing for the LGBTQ kids. What can we do? They didn't even know that we have a group here. The kids at the schools don't know because I can't get into the schools because they tell me when I ask that if they need help, they'll let me know. But she knows several teachers there. She knows art teachers there. Her kids go there. So she would like to start a group that will meet at the library, Lodi Library, um, once a month. And maybe, we're thinking maybe not being in a church setting, maybe more of the kids will come to that meeting. And then once they come there, we can get them to come over here. And we can go over there and support their meeting and help each other out. But right now, we're going to try to get the kids over there. Her thing is, it's just as mine has always been, even if we say just one child, we've done everything we can do. That would be great. So her and I will meet again, and we're going to get some signs made up and some things done, and her kids are going to hang them at school, they're going to talk to the teachers, and in September, when school starts again, we're going to get a group going over at Lodi after school to see, to see how that goes. But I was astounded, and she said, I've seen your church, and I, and I was so excited when I saw the rainbow sticker and the sign out front. It gave me hope. But when I was talking to people around me, they're like, does anybody even go to that church still? Is it open? What's going on over there? And these are people in this area. They don't even know. So we're going to have to sit down and come up way, with ways to let people know that we are here, not just for LGBTQ people, but for all people in the area that have more of a liberal mind and are seeking for justice and peace. And we'll have to brainstorm some ways to, to be able to do that. I was shocked by what she had to say, but I'm so glad that she came to see me and we had that conversation. And not only that, we have other things that we're working on. We're going to help the refugees in Sanctuary in Akron. We're collecting still. Amazingly, we have over $200 in there already. And the, the uh, minister from Akron will be here at the end of July. He'll be doing one of the services to talk about the Sanctuary Church and what, they're, what they'll be doing and how, what else we can do to help. Because the people won't be allowed to leave the church. Somebody will have to shop for them. Somebody will have to help them with schooling for the kids. All kinds of things. So we'll listen to what he has to say. But that's another area that we're certainly going to help in. So I'm asking for money to do the real work. The work that the Unitarian Universalists exist to do. When I was a kid, it was all about pledge cards and building a new league. But I've tried hard to stay away from pledge cards and guilt in order to focus on the things that matter. We are zealous. Let's play in a war zone. Now, I'd like to write down some of our dreams about peace and justice and love. If money were no object, what would you like to do? No commitments here, no names, just ideas and dreams. It doesn't have to be realistic or something you could see us doing, but let's just get a list. I'm going to write them down over here. If you're interested in something somebody else has already said, say that too. I'm going to call this our cello list, like a bucket list, except that we want to do for someone else. No object. What else do you think that we could do? We could reach out. We need to reach out somehow and grow the congregation. What else? If we could do anything at all we had money and we could do anything in this community to, or around the world to help others, what would we do? What would you do? What would, what would you want to be part of? We need to get... I think we need to um, make, let people know or get people to understand that there's a place for them to go that will respect 
and understand their beliefs and, and not judge them. Uh, Some place that they can gain the help, the spiritual help or community. Be it this church or any of the other churches of the I'll go with that. I think that's really important. Though we are here and need their help for justice, work. Is that good? Well, I think it's more rather than we need their help for ju- the fact that they have a place to go where they won't be judged, a okay. place that they can they can find refuge here for for spiritual matters, as the the Montrose Church is trying to set up a refuge for immigration matters or you know refugee matters. Yeah, I think there's lonely peace and justice people in the area that just feel like they're the only ones that really want to make a difference and a lot of their friends don't agree with what they're doing and I don't know how to find lonely sort of peace and justice by the church is in such an isolated area. I mean, we're off the beaten path. Nobody comes here unless they have to be here. But that doesn't mean that there aren't people within our own small community that don't feel like we feel. And maybe maybe the only way to, to reach those people right now would be to put something on the sign every week that indicates that, that tells people that we're a safe place, that tells people that they would be welcome here regardless of anything and do that every week. I mean, it, you know, we put out our sign for what our, our message is, but maybe this is more important. How about you? The sign next door, the Vacation Bible School sign, that big, huge sign they have out front, everybody that drives by sees that. It's huge. I know they have laws at Westfield Center about how long you're allowed to have a sign up. And I, I believe the uh, lady that came here on Friday talked to me said it's like three weeks. But well, we could put a sign up for two or three weeks, take it down, put it back up. I'd like to get a big sign, one that says LGBTQ meeting here. I think we need something on our regular sign every week that is welcoming and not just informative on what we're doing. Mm-hmm. Not an open. What? Open. Open. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, because yeah, there's people yeah, out here in this area that think that we're not even open. Yeah. Like, do people even go there on Sunday? That's what she asked me. Wow. I've got a couple. Open every Sunday. <laughs> yeah, I've got a couple of ideas uh, about that we can discuss in the board meeting on how to, to kind of be more inclusive and put more information on the signs. So. Right. That would be great. Yes. Okay. And I'm not sure I'm going to say this right, but... I look at my son, and who's 20, and, I, and, and other kids his age, and friends and everything. Um, and I wish there was a way in their minds to decouple spirituality from all the horrible things that have been done in the name of religion. Because so many of them um, turn their their back on the spirituality because of the preponderance of evil done in the name of, of, of religion. Um, and so they go into this sort of agnostic or atheist mode, not in, in yeah, see, I'm having a hard time, but I wish I could decouple that. Mm-hmm. So to say it's a church, right? But it's not church with the capital C and all the baggage. And I don't know how to do that. And I, I don't even know that there is. I love what Sam said about it's deeds, not creeds. Right. I real. I love that statement. Yeah. But that's part of the safety too. I mean, it's 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 
safe on the, I mean, I was scared of coming here. I'll be perfectly honest. I was terrified the first time because I didn't want to be told I was going to hell and I didn't want people to save my soul and I didn't want all that negativity and, and a lot of the stuff that, that I have experienced. Um, walking into a church is, comes with baggage. So I don't... I think that goes back to what Glenn was saying, where we, to get the message out somehow that we are a place where no matter what your beliefs, you can come here. You yeah. won't be judged, you won't be told you're going to hell, right. you know, that kind of thing. So I think... Well, there's no hypocrisy. Yeah. Yeah. There's, there's no hypocrisy yeah. between. There you go. Big sign. Hypocrisy. Hypocrisy. Not, yeah. <laughs> not welcome here. Oh, That's the big hypocrisy. Well, there's, many UU churches have changed their name to, from church to fellowship. What's the ah. name of both our fellowship? Mm -hmm. So, church is not anywhere in their name. Yeah. And they're. What story has, I don't know, 200 members or so. And Lion is growing. They have about 40 right now. but. Just the night, just the difference in names. Fellowship sounds, it still sounds churchy. Mm -hmm. You don't say, I'm going out with my friends tonight, we're going to have some great fellowship. Yeah. You know, it's a church, a word you use in church contexts. Yeah. And we've been at church for a long time. I don't know, maybe I, maybe other people do say they're going out for fellowship, but it yeah. still sounds. Yeah. But maybe, maybe it is sort of the thing that, that we get across in, in like said, those signs. Where it's a it's a changing up thing, where it's a you know atheist welcome, come share, you know, and then you know I, I don't know how to the unchurch. Yeah, they, unchurch. yeah, exactly the unchurch. Yeah, I don't know. I'm just saying that that's something I, I see in those kids. It's, it's they turn. It, I mean, he's throwing the baby out with the bathwater, really. Anybody else right now? We'll keep these two, and we'll put them in there so that we have them to go over. Anybody else have anything right now? Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. So I'm gonna, we're going to hang this up in the fireside room or the basement, wherever everybody wants to. And let's talk to each other about how to heal the world and maybe think of things that we can do. I'd like to throw in that part of my dream would be to find more people like us and others feel that way. Maybe we could brainstorm and maybe we could be the cello player in this war zone. We stand and we're going to sing this little light of mine. <laughs>